This is part one of two videos on doing the fording for a leather binding with laced on boards. Okay, so there's a lot of things to unpack here. So first we'll address fording. Sometimes the trade of book binding is divided into fording and finishing. In that context, fording is all the steps up to the decoration of the book. And then the finishing is all the gold tooling in a traditional 19th century English binding. However, in, the, in this video series, it's all the steps up to covering the book. So we'll be lacing on the boards, uh, applying the hollow to the spine, um, the back cornering, but it's not applying the covering. So while I'm talking about the project, I'm folding 20 uh, four sheet sections, which I'll then press overnight. I wanted a fairly thick book for this project because I, I think this size is about the optimal for uh, ease of execution. I was looking for an actual book to print, but I couldn't find one the right size uh, for the project. So I've just gone with lined paper. The reason I'm doing the videos this way is so that I don't have to redo the fording component for a number of different leather covering styles. So the first one I'll do is a full leather binding without raised bands and then I'll do a full leather binding with raised bands and then I'll do a half leather binding with raised bands. Now of course this is a hollow back book so the cords are recessed or sunken into the spine so these will be false bands. Okay so now I'm making the end papers I'm doing made end papers so I've got my colored which is paste paper and I'll laminate laminate those to whites and then I'll put another folio of white inside the first folio of white. These end papers will be sewn onto the text block. Now, for some reason, I forgot to put a waste sheet on these end papers, and for this style of book, it should have a waste sheet. So, I have a video on making these end papers, so I really recommend you go and have a look at that video where I show in a lot of detail how to make this end paper and add the waste sheet. Now, adding the waste sheet is simply tipping on a folio of white to the side with the white and wrapping the loose leaf of white around to the outside and that will be the waste which will be torn off before pasting down the outside end paper. The waste sheet just provides protection to the book during the numerous processes where you can get uh, damage the outside of the book. Now these two videos will act as the fording for three covering styles. However, one of the covering styles is slightly different. Now when I'm apply covering the books with leather, the leather will be completely wet. When the leather dries, it will shrink significantly and pull on the boards with quite a bit of force. Now if the boards, if I was just using grey board, the boards would end up warped outwards. So to counter that outward pull, I'm going to line the inside of the boards with uh, bank paper, or bank layout. Now I've got a video on doing this in detail as well, so I won't describe it in detail here. But all it'll do is end up with these boards being stiffer and slightly warped inwards, which will then get straightened out when the leather is applied. And the leather will pull out and hopefully about equal to the pull of this paper. Now, of course, there will also be the paste downs, which will pull inwards. Uh, and there's also an opportunity to adjust the warp of the boards uh, after the leather is applied. Now there's one exception to the videos in that I'll also do a half binding and for that binding um, 
I won't line the boards like I am here because the, the, there's not enough leather uh, on the boards to cause enough outward pull to counter. When I do the video on the half leather binding, I will point that out so that it's uh, so you won't forget it. Just like when I do the false raised bands, there's a little detail about the spacing of the recess cords, and I'll uh, go over that detail when I do that covering style. Now I'm sure you've noticed that I'm doing four boards, and it's not that I need four boards for this video. Uh, it's just that uh, when you're lining boards, you may as well uh, do more than your immediate need. You'll need them at some point in the future anyway. So I end up doing six. Now this binding is very much in the English style. That doesn't mean there aren't other traditions that aren't similar, but uh, the people who've taught me this and the books that I've used have all been English. So I'm going to mark up the spine for the sewing. So I'm going to come in um, 12 millimeter. Well, I'm going to mark uh, trim lines. So I'll come in three millimeters for the trim mark. Uh, then I'll go 10 millimeters. I'll go a little bit further in 12 millimeters at the tail because it's a bit because uh, I'll knock up to the head all the time. So all the unevenness will end up at the tail. I've just put a diagonal line to keep the sections in um, the right order. Now I'm going to do so on four cords. I, I will um, saw these cords in. So I'll um, space these equally. So this particular book will not have uh, raised bands on it. Now if I was doing a book where I was going to put false raised bands on it, I would put the cord locations where the false raised bands are going to be, and I would make the lower panel slightly larger, as is traditional, to optically center the book. I'm going to sew on hemp cords. These cords are six ply hemp cords, and I'm going to split them to have two ply for each sewing location. So one cord I'll get uh, three out of and I'll need a one from a second. So I've taken the six ply, divided it up so I've got two plies and then retwisted them. So again I have a video on sewing uh, recessed cords so I go into a lot of detail there so I'm not going to repeat it all here. But the main thing is that, that at the kettle stitch locations, it's a shallow vertical cut. And where the cords are going to be, it's slightly wider it's, and it's undercut. Uh, and it's just deep enough so that the cords will fit snugly in the uh, saw cuts. So I'll uh, test that in a moment to make sure that I've got it the way I like it. Even though these cords are recessed and I'll put some effort into making them smooth where they're laced into the boards, I think with cords it's impossible to uh, not have some sign of the cords through the leather covering. I think in the joint uh, you'll always notice uh, the cords. Uh, if you don't want the sewing supports to be noticeable, I, I guess you really need to go to sewing on tapes and then lacing in the tapes. I think where I'm going with this is, uh, I know I'm going to get questions about how thick the cords should be that you uh, sew on or use for supports. So I want a cord that's thick enough, that it's strong, but not too thick that it's going to have an unsightly bump at the uh, joint uh, on the book uh, after it's covered with leather. So that sort of comes with experience because it depends on the leather that you're using. Uh, well, it strongly depends on the leather that you're using, I think. Um, so it really comes with experience and I guess 
uh, these uh, the hemp cords that I'm using are from Hewitt's and two or three ply is a good starting point. Fairly recently I was asked whether I ever used sewing frames and the reason I got the question was that a number of my recent projects the sewing support has been on tapes and when I'm doing uh, sewing on two tapes you know, the tapes are stiff uh, there's no huge advantage to setting up the sewing frame it, it, it uh, takes longer to set up the sewing frame uh, than any advantage that it provides However, when sewing on cords, you really need something to keep the cords um, stretched out under tension uh, and in place. So you don't need a fancy sewing frame like this. You can improvise quite easily. Uh, however, if you do have a nice sewing frame like this, it's, it's quite uh, pleasant to use. I think one day I'm going to ask Frank to make me a German style top bar. I've never used one but the idea of having individual hooks with uh, wing nuts on them so that you can tension up each of the cords individually uh, instead of doing it with a piece of paper like I'm doing here uh, seems really appealing. It seems like a really good idea and uh, one day I'll do it I'm sure. Since I have a video on this sewing style I'm not going to go through describing it again Instead, I'll use the time to mention uh, the books that are relevant to this uh, binding. So there's uh, four really good books that uh, cover this binding structure. So number one is Arthur Johnson and the Thames and Hudson Manual. The next best one, I think, is... Uh, book Binding by Hand by Lawrence Town. Then probably almost equal to that, uh, I'd rate uh, William Matthews's book on book binding, whose title I, I've forgotten and I don't have it right in front of me. And then finally, The Craft of Book Binding, a Practical Handbook by Eric Burdett. Uh, Burdett has a lot of detail, uh, probably a little bit too much detail maybe, uh, but it is... Uh, uh, really good book um, and those four books are four of my go-to books and have been for many many years I'll have that uh, I'll put them in the description um, but I think with those four those four books if you're interested in traditional uh, book binding especially in an English style they must have books and they pretty much um, do this st um, structure to death so when I uh, do these videos, I try and be careful with my terminology. I try and make sure that I'm consistent. However, I have old habits and sometimes my old habits are wrong. So I thought I'd just check the terminology around the board attachment. So uh, I've found that I always say lacing on and that's consistent with Johnson. Uh, which is also consistent with the fact that uh, Johnson was my first book on book binding. But uh, Matthews and Town say lacing in instead of lacing on. And Burdett says uh, boards are drawn on. So he talks about drawing on the boards. So I'm sure if you were apprentices in those different uh, schools, then you would have had it... Uh, beaten into you that the correct terminology is either lacing in, lacing on, or drawing on the boards. Mm -hmm.
Now I'm going to sew on the end papers and it's at this point that I realize that I've forgotten to put the extra folio of whites in so I'll have to fold a couple of whites and then I'll trim up the end papers, uh, sew on the end papers and then I'll tip on the first and last sections and the end papers. The idea of tipping on those is that uh, in the rounding process uh, those the first and the outer sections and the end papers can have a lot of force on them and uh, they can shoot forward so that prevents that happening. Now it's time to glue the spine of the book. So knock up the book to the head and the spine uh, really well. Now I only do this when I'm ready to trim and round the book because I don't want the adhesive to set up too hard. So I'm using PVA which is quite flexible uh, but it will go harder over time. Now if you're doing a number of books uh, at once and the adhesive sets up, you leave them a few days. Uh, you can soften the adhesive if it's PVA or even hide glue I guess if you're using hide glue uh, with a bit of heat. So I will apply a little bit of mild heat with a heat gun uh, before I round the book. Of course in the middle of gluing the spine I realized that I hadn't frayed out the cords. So really you should fray out the cords before applying the adhesive to the spine because it's just too easy to get adhesive on the cords or the slips uh, which makes them hard to fray out. So I'll do it in a moment but uh, do the fraying out then glue up the spine. Now we want to fray out the slips as they're now known now that they've been uh, used on the book. So just untwist the hemp cords and very gently run it over the back of something like a the back of a knife. Uh, I'm using a micro spatula here. Um, but you don't want to pull too much material out. So you want to be gentle on them. Uh, you just need to uh, unfray them so that we can saturate them with paste later and so that we can um, flatten them 
uh, when we lace them into the boards. So I'll transfer the trim marks to the front of the book, but I'll also mark the shoulders. So the shoulders should be the thickness of the board, so I'll use the boards to mark that. Uh, I'll take off as little material as possible at the foredge, but enough to make sure that it's all smooth. I just mark, transferred the trim marks up to the front of the book and mark those. And then I will use the plow to trim the book. Uh, since I've described that in a separate video, I won't describe it here, but I'll quickly show most of the steps. The order I'm going to execute this work is that I'm going to trim the foredge first, then I'll round the book, then I will back the book, I'll put the shoulders on the book, and then I'll trim the head and the tail. Now you could uh, trim the head and the tail after rounding the book and then back the book, put the shoulders on the book. But I prefer uh, the order I mentioned first because then you've got the book in its final shape uh, before trimming the head and the tail. And then if you do any edge de decoration, there'll be no disruption to that decoration by the backing process. Now for the backing process, uh, as usual, I start uh, gently hitting the spine of the book away, just off the center line of the spine at about a third of the length of the book. I'll go back and forth a little bit uh, so that the sections start to lean over and then I'll start working my way out further and further until I reach the ends of the book. Now the ends of the book, the, they don't have any thread inside the sections, so they're the most vulnerable, they're the hardest parts of the book to back. So it's good if the sections are already leaning over before you work your way towards the ends because the uh, sections will then just follow the sections that have already started to fold over. That's my thinking on the subject anyway. And finally, I'll crisp up the shoulders by uh, forcing a grey board into the shoulders and then using a, a bone folder to uh, run it over the shoulders with a bit of force. So when ploughing the head and the tail, I have to protect the shoulders. So I have some boards that I will put uh, in uh, to the uh, front and back of the book and they will protect the shoulders in the press. And of course, I go into more detail in the video uh, on using a plough. 
last thing we'll do in this video is cut the boards to size. So I'll use the usual process of truing one edge and squaring the end, cutting them to length. So I'll have three millimeter squares. So the length of the boards will be six millimeters longer than the book. I'll mark the front and back boards. And I'll have a three millimeter square at the fore edge. Um, you can maybe have a four millimeter square. Some people like a slightly larger square at the fore edge. That's this week done, and next week in the final video on the fording, we'll do the end bands, we'll line the spine with a hollow tube, and then lace on the boards and any other final preparations before covering in leather. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you have, please hit the big thumbs up button, and if you want to be notified of my future videos, such as finishing the fording of this book, then hit the subscribe button. Uh, take care and until next time, cheerio.